There are people who are very much in favor of what the Founding Fathers have done in Pennsylvania and Philadelphia specifically, and there are those who are very much opposed to it. Much of the rest of early America will sort of devolve into Hamilton versus Jefferson argument, and this is very much an example of how that's going to work. So, for example, Hamilton is at the Constitutional Convention. He's a major factor in how the Constitution is, is, is written and sort of thought about. Jefferson is in Paris. He's in France. And he's not really part of the conversation. So when the Constitutional text is unveiled, there are a lot of people, and Jefferson being one of them, is very much concerned about what he's reading. He believes that there is just too much power in the hands of a centralized government. Now remember, when the Founding Fathers sit down to write the Constitution, it was widely believed that this was going to tinker with the Articles of Confederation, not completely destroy the Articles of Confederation. A lot of people, especially Southerners, were relatively happy with the Articles of Confederation, and all you had to do was tweak around the edges and it would be fine. There are those, however, and of course Hamilton is one of them, but so is Washington as well, who believe that the Articles of Confederation are fundamentally broken and have to be completely replaced. And that's really where we're at when the Constitution is unveiled um, in about 1791 or so. So a ratification fight begins. And there are certain places, like for example, um, in New Jersey, and a few others where ratification is is fairly quick, fairly straightforward. Delaware's on the on the bandwagon pretty quickly, as you can see. Maryland doesn't take too long, although it's a little more contentious. And before you know it, Connecticut's in the pool as well, and you are up to four. Now you need nine to ratify, so you're already up to four. A real turning point in this conversation, though, is with Massachusetts. So Massachusetts does ratify the Constitution. However, there is a very, very contentious floor fight in the Massachusetts legislature over this, including fistfights. And it's only because people like John Adams rise to, to speak and say, listen, we're going to protect the rights of individuals. We promise you we will make sure that the Constitution is a protective, not a tyrannical document. It's only because John Adams comes forward, along with others, of course, and makes these statements that Massachusetts passes this thing. But there are real hotbeds of insurrection about this. New York, Virginia, Carolinas, Georgia. These places are very, very concerned with what they're seeing here. Uh, and look at Rhode Island. Rhode Island is 1790. These are places where people are very, very concerned about what they're reading, and they're not convinced that the federal government is going to be for the people, but rather govern over the people. And that's really what it comes down to. What ends up happening is you have the anti-federalists and the federalists. These people are um, basically lining up against each other, the federalists and the anti-federalists. And it's also, you know, Hamilton and Jefferson as well. So the Federalists, of whom you can count people like uh, James Madison, at least at first, people like John Jay, Alexander Hamilton, these are Americans who believe that centralized power is super important and we have to ratify the Constitution. And they use this thing called the Federalist Papers, Federalist Papers to justify their beliefs. There are approximately about 85 Federalist Papers, and they're, and they're not simple little pamphlets. They're actually long documents written by, by Jay, Madison, and Hamilton, largely Hamilton, quite frankly. And they appear in New York City newspapers. And, you know, some of there's, there's a number of important ones, but 14, 84, 78, these are really important Federalist Papers. Uh, they're, again, they're super long, but they're basically arguing why the Constitution must pass. And the Federalists believe that the government is given power by the Constitution, and unless it specifically says 
that you can't do something in the Constitution, then you can do it. This is called a loose interpretation of the Constitution. It's going to come back in a big way in Washington's presidency, and we'll talk about that down the line. On the other hand, you have the Anti-Federalists. And of course, as I mentioned, Jefferson is one of the most famous of the Anti-Federalists. And these guys are basically against the adoption of the Constitution because they're very suspicious of people like Hamilton and any political action that's going to limit freedom and the role of a central government. They're very worried about the British model of governance. They don't like a king. They don't want a powerful central figure. This is people like George Mason, Patrick Henry, George Clinton, and of course, Thomas Jefferson. And they, they really become super absorbed in Hamilton. They really do not like Alexander Hamilton. They're very concerned with what they're seeing from him. They think he's a monarchist and they do everything in their power to try to slander his name. And this is again going to spill over into the presidency of George Washington in a big way, which we'll talk about down the line in a separate video. So how does this get solved? How do you bring the Carolinas, New York, Rhode Island, how do you bring them into the fold? Well, they bring them into the fold with, of course, the Bill of Rights. Here's a real simplified version of the Bill of Rights. They bring these people into, into the fold with the Bill of Rights because they realize, the Federalists realize, they're not going to get this thing passed. They're not going to get to nine out of 13. It's actually 14 at this point, 14 states. They're not going to get to four, to nine out of 14 without something to appease the Jeffersons, the Masons, the Henrys, the Clintons. They're not going to be able to solve this problem without addressing the Federalist concern, the Anti-Federalist concern, specifically about the power of the central government. So people like Madison write 17 amendments to the Constitution, of which 12 are approved by the Senate, and then another 12 are adopted by Congress. Okay, And these 12 end up going back to the states. And to amend the Constitution, not only do you need Congress to approve, but you also need um, three-fourths of the states to ratify them. And when it's all said and done, by 1791, the Bill of Rights is added to the Constitution, and you start to see people sort of simmer down about this concern about the power of the federal government. Now, the Bill of Rights is a truly remarkable document in itself. And as I've mentioned in previous videos, the Quartering Act, for example, Quartering Act is directly imaged here in the Third Amendment to the Constitution. Um, and also, of course, the freedom from unreasonable searches and seizures. This has its role in a variety of things, whether it's the Zanger case with freedom of the press and speech, or various other assemblies and petitions. Specifically, this can refer to the Intolerable Acts. The Bill of Rights is a remarkable document because it, it is absolutely reflective of the times and what these people went through. People like Washington, people like Hamilton and Madison and Jefferson who have seen what tyranny looks like with the king and they are very